Good morning, Ms. Pena. Good morning. You have 10 minutes, and you can see it on this clock here. And one minute before the end, the yellow one will start to flash. And when the 10 minutes is up, the red one will start to flash. Thank you, Your Honor, for allowing me this opportunity to be before you. Today I'm before you to question the constitutionality of a statute that was attached to cruelty to animals statutes. This statute, Section 272.104, allows the illegal taking of property, the property in this case, which happens to be my livestock and horses, were taken by the MSPCA on allegations of cruelty to animals prior to an application for a criminal complaint. The statute, in the way that it was written, allows for this nonprofit agency or another nonprofit agency who both regulate animal cruelty statutes for dog racing, horse racing, dog fighting, to control what goes on. And right now, currently, the way it's being applied against me, I have animals that were legitimately sick or tampered with. There was evidence that my horse's tails were being cut off. There was evidence that my barn was being destroyed by outside parties. The animals became sick of some unknown origin. The animals were quarantined. I did everything in my possibility to protect my animals. I asked to be able to remove my animals from the property. What they did is they came in with this invalid search warrant and began civil proceedings, which is a much lower threshold, that to be able to take my animals away from me, requesting a $120,000 bond, which was reduced to $45,000. I'm a farmer. I make my living by breeding and training American quarter horses. Even on my best years, I make about $30,000 to $40,000. The bond for $45,000 was a great hardship. We're also in Massachusetts. This is a bond-free state, so it wasn't like I could go to a bail bondsman and put up $40,000 for a $400,000 bond. You have to actually have that in cash. I don't have that in cash. These animals are used as collateral against my farm mortgage. They're UCCs. I travel. I ship semen into state. And this, to me, is all part of ploys with animal rights people to violate farmers and people who breed animals' constitutional rights. They've been able to take my animals and prevent me from having a defense. I had to basically go into the Superior Court because the District Court did not allow for certain elements to be acted on because a criminal complaint had not been filed. The criminal complaint in this statute says that it has to be filed within 30 days. It was not filed for three months. And as that time went over, they were able to raise the bills and create larger expenses for me. What this comes right down to is due process. The old laws on the books for 272.77 say that they can't take the animals or get control of the animals or complete control of the animals until they've found me guilty. This new law allows them to take control of the animals prior to me and tell me I've been told that, you know, for the last, since 2004, that these are no longer my animals. They belong to them because I didn't post this bond, which constitutes a taking. My position is that, you know, this was illegal. I've been not allowed due process. The hurdle that they would have had to jump in a criminal case is much higher than what they would do in a civil case. The procedures were inappropriately, and this, again, it's not just a case of a taking. It's a case of due process. The trial goes forward, and we get to an end. At the beginning, after arraignment, they tell me they're going to null process the case. And I was like, if you null process the case, I still have this appeal in because you violated it. We wait three or four, two years here. The case is null process. They now realize that this is going to cause them a problem, and they turn around now and file. Are you telling me that the case 
has been no process? The original case that went with this bond was no process. And because they feared having to give me back the animals, the original case had three charges of cruelty to animals. After we went through trial, after we went through discovery, and we were able to show autopsies and police reports, then um, the judge that sat on that case said that he would not turn over the animals to them because he equated the animals similar to a, a drug seizure where somebody's house is seized and their cars are seized and then after the property is seized and the person is found guilty of drug charges that that um, property could be taken through an action in superior court and he said that he was not going to allow these horses to be turned over to the um, MSPCA or the Animal Rescue League. So with, with that, they turned around and then filed complaints because they only had three charges of 157 complaints now, three years later, for the same date to say that I was cruel to the animals, which we still have the same problems in the case. We still have constitutional issues. We still have bill of particular issues. We still have violations of um, several issues in the criminal, but the, the issue that I'm here for today is this is an unconstitutional statute that was attached to another statute that for animal cruelty that allows them to come in to, and to be the judge and jury if we over sick animals or any type of animals and say we're going to take them and you have no authority to do anything here. Ms. Payne, let me ask you this. Um, even if uh, even if you're correct, and I assume that you are, that some of the charges have been null plus, they are ongoing criminal proceedings, correct? All of the charges in the first case were non -pro null plus. But they are now ongoing criminal Now there, there are new charges that I'm going to be arraigned for coming up in um, on the 10th of this month. But for almost a 30-day period, there have been no charges, and they were just going to walk away until I went to Superior Court and filed an injunction, because it, until they find me guilty, they can't take these animals away from me. So we have two statutes on the book, one that's been on the books that was working absolutely perfect, which said that they had to find me guilty before they could take these animals, which afforded me all those constitutional rights. And this new statute that's been put onto the books, it says they can take these animals prior to that and then, you know, decide whether they want to prosecute me or not. And, and either way, um, the first statute denies me civil rights. It deni I, I have un I've been able to have vets go and look at the animals. I've been unable for myself to go with a vet. I've been unable with myself to go with uh, uh, my own attorney to examine the animals because um, the animal industry is not something like lawyers understand. So to explain stuff to the, an to, the, to the veterinarians, they've taken and already castrated two of the animals while they've had the animals in their possession. Two of the animals have died, which just proves to the case that, you know, I had several that died when they were in my possession, but they've continued dying while they've been in their possession. And they said that I wasn't feeding them properly, I wasn't watering. I have proof of feeding, watering, and graining, and the animals were still dying. They, this was more malicious because they, the, this nonprofit organization knew that I was having hay and grain delivered. They stopped the truck and the trailers and prevented from hay, hay and grain from being delivered to the farm so they could say there was no food on the farm and take the animals. When we were able to later find out that, you know, they signed, the truck driver had the, the officer sign saying we're refusing the three tons of food that was going to my farm to say so they could justify the fact there was no no food on my farm. This is a total misuse of the system and, and my constitutional rights have been violated in several areas in the fourth. I'm not a lawyer. I'm having to do this pro se because normally um, my income would come from the horses and I would be able to afford an attorney to represent me. But now that I, they've taken these animals, I have no income. I'm totally um, indigent and I'm having to file for these until I get my animals back in order to reestablish my business and reestablish my livelihood. But this is my livelihood and they've totally destroyed it by, by taking and going around some constitutional laws. The Constitution protects me and protects these animals because they're my property. I, I've bred these animals. I've had them for their whole entire lives. I've done nothing but breed and train American quarter horses. Some of these horses are world champions and world titles. There's no reason that I would 
poison or kill my own animals. There was a theory that they were saying that I was killing my own animals to collect the insurance. There was a, a lawsuit going on with my town because they were, viol they were not wanting me to rebuild my barn or add additional stalls. And they were thinking that I poisoned and killed my horses to collect the insurance. The, the horses that have insurance on them or had insurance on them are still alive and they were only one and the insurance was canceled prior to the, the taking. There's, there's no, if you were to look at this from Occam's Razor, here's a person who makes their livelihood from these horses and breeding and training. I have no reason to see my animals. And at the same time, I'm calling the police to say the barn's doors have been ripped off. Um, they've come into the barn and they've cut all my horses' tails off. I, I show these animals, I take them and I represent them to customers. I wouldn't want to represent them looking the way they were looking. And then there was evidence showing that my, my well had been contaminated. Um, I, you know, I did everything in my possibility, but the, the main issue is due process and constitutional rights here that, that have been trampled over by these animal rights organizations who feel that it's okay to eliminate racing, it's okay to eliminate breeding. No one spades. A, a horse. You just don't read it. Mr. Pina, um, your time is up and I thank you for your uh, oral argument today and of course we will also uh, read the written submissions that have been filed with the court. Thank you. And then we will issue a judgment in due course. Thank you. Mr. Mangavan. Good morning. May it please the court. My name is Timothy Mungovan. With me is my colleague Stephen LaRose. We represent the MSPCA. Uh, this case is before the court uh, pursuant to a petition under General Laws Chapter 211, Section 3. We contend that the petition should be denied because there is no extraordinary basis for relief here. There is no clear error of law committed by the single justice. There is no abuse of discretion committed by the single justice. Mr. Mungovan, let me ask you this. Uh, I take it that um, uh, there was some delay between the time these uh, horses were removed from um, uh, Ms. Pina's property and the issuance of a complaint? Uh, Your Honor, there was, there was a period of time, yes. The, the horses were removed from the petitioner's property on November 3, 2004. An application for a criminal complaint was filed, I believe, on December 18th, and the show cause hearing uh, on that application took place on March 18th. I will note for the record, though, Your Honor, that the petitioner herself requested an extension of time to have the show cause hearing of two weeks. Well, what is the proceeding that precedes uh, getting an order to remove the animals? Uh, Your Honor, what happened here is an officer of the MSPCA visited the property four different times in October of 2004. Based on those visits to the property and the information that she learned during those visits, she applied for a search warrant uh, pursuant to General Laws Chapter 272, Section 77. And that application was filed on November 2, 2004. And she attached to that application this is an officer of the MSPCA, an affidavit in which she set out the information on which she was basing her application for the issuance of the warrant. Right. And then the warrant issued. The warrant was executed on November 3rd, 2004. While, those, while executing the warrant, 28 horses and 33 sheep were seized and taken into custody by the MSPCA. And that was pursuant to the warrant. The that's, warrant authorized not that, only a search, but a seizure. Right? That's correct, Your Honor. It expressly provided for the search and the seizure of those animals. And, and the basis for the application for the warrant, Your Honors, is this. In the middle of October, the MSPCA received information from the, uh, the State uh, Department of Agriculture and Food suggesting that there were problems with horses dying at the petitioner's farm. The MSPCA went out to the farm. And the, uh, with the Animal Rescue League, two officers, one from each of those agencies. And when they arrived at the farm, the petitioner informed the officers that five of her horses had died the previous weekend. While they were at the farm that day, during the first, the first time they were at the farm, a horse collapsed in front of them and had to be euthanized. Mr. Uh, uh, um, Mungovan, 
I understand the facts. I'm really trying to understand the circumstances. I mean, it's undisputed, I think, that this is the petitioner's livelihood, correct? I don't – there's no basis to dispute it, no, Your Honor. But I will say this, though, with respect to her livelihood, she did not raise these issues in her opposition. That's a – I understand there are lots of things that may or may not have been – I'm just trying to understand how the statutory scheme works. And I take it that it's your client's position that it is the – the illegal conduct is the mistreatment of animals? Yes, Your Honor. What we contend is that there is a basis for the warrant to issue. There is probable cause to believe, based on the application and the affidavit for the issuance of the warrant, to believe that the petitioner violated General Laws Chapter 272, Section 77 by not properly caring for her animals. She was starving them to death, Your Honor. Not to mention the fact that they – there is evidence replete in the record that she was not caring for these animals, not only by starving them, not giving them adequate – What is the – what are the – what are the consequences if there's – there's a – there are criminal proceedings in progress, but what – what are the consequences, either if the criminal proceedings are not crossed or if there's an acquittal? Let me answer that question two ways. First of all, we don't believe that the issue of null process is properly before the Court for procedural reasons. But to answer your question directly, Your Honor, because the null process occurred approximately one month ago, to answer your question directly, the null process in this case should have no material impact upon the order to post security, because while the case was null processed, contemporaneous with it being null processed, I am told by the Assistant District Attorneys and the DA's office that there was an express statement that they would be refiling new charges, because the reason that null process occurred, I'm told, is that the Court decided that only three animals, based on – on the way that the complaint was drafted, that only three animals would be the subject of the criminal charges. And what the Commonwealth was concerned with was the fact that there were, in fact, 61 animals here, and they wanted to make sure that the criminal proceedings applied to all 61. So they null processed the complaint and informed the Court that they would be filing a new complaint – a new application for a complaint, which they did the next day. And then a matter of a week and a half ago, a new complaint was, in fact, issued, Your Honor. My question really is what happens – what's the status of these horses if this – in the – at the conclusion of the criminal proceedings, the petitioner is either acquitted or there's some further null process of these complaints? With respect to these horses specifically, right now, there is an order in place that precludes the MSPCA from taking any actions with respect to these animals, such as adopting them out, which is what the MSPCA would typically want to do with animals so that it does not have to incur the costs of caring for them. There is an order that bars the MSPCA from doing that. The MSPCA has incurred $135,000 in costs caring for these animals to date. What would happen in the event of an acquittal is the MSPCA would have to evaluate whether to move forward and ask the court still – the district court – still to order the forfeiture of these animals or whether the animals would be returned. I would suggest, though, Your Honor, that the statute gives us some clue as to what would likely happen. And when I refer to the statute, that's 272 section 104. And the very last sentence in the last paragraph, which is subparagraph J, the court says – or the statute says, the court may direct a refund to the person who posted security upon acquittal of the charges. But what happens to the horses? That's the – that's the question. Have the horses been forfeited now? No, they have not. There's been no order of forfeiture, Your Honor. We would like – Are they still the legal property? Of the petitioner. Yes, Your Honor. Here's – here's the important – And the bond is used to pay for their upkeep. Correct. Pending further order. Correct. And no bond has been actually posted. No security, as the word is used in the statute, has been posted. Now, what the statute provides in subparagraph F is that security that has been ordered or was ordered to be posted has to be posted within 10 days of the show cause hearing, 10 business days. And I want to note that we erred in our brief. We just referred to 10 days. It's 10 business days. 
and on the ninth business day before the ten days ran after the show cause hearing the petitioner filed a motion in the district court asking that the forfeiture be stayed and the court denied that motion six days later after the ten day period had run. Now I believe that the MSPCA still has the burden under subparagraph F in the second sentence to go back and ask the court to order a forfeiture. Even if there's an acquittal, the MSPCA may still seek the forfeiture of this animal. But I believe that the court in its discretion may decide not to order the forfeiture. And the reason- Here's the import of my question. Yes, Your Honor. Assuming, and I'm not asking you to, you know, make any representations that you don't want to make on behalf of your client as to what might happen. But I take it from your responses that in the event that this defendant, that this petitioner is acquitted, that whatever economic harm she may have suffered as a result of the seizure of the horses and the cost of maintaining the horses can be remedied in post-criminal proceedings, in proceedings that occur after the criminal proceedings, correct? I'm not sure if you're talking about our remedying, the MSPCA remedying whatever harm the petitioner claims to have suffered or vice versa. Yes. Can she file a complaint for just compensation for the loss of her property? Without taking a position that would be adverse to my client, I can't imagine right now standing here a reason why she can't make some type of civil claim against the MSPCA. Well, not against the MSPCA. I mean, the MSPCA, I take it, is acting, you know, under authority of the- Under color of state law, yes, Your Honor. Can she claim, can she, I take it that whatever economic harm, are there any out-of-pocket economic harms so far from her? She's posted- She's posted nothing, Your Honor. Okay. The MSPCA has incurred $135,000 in costs caring for these animals. And so I would suggest that in the event that there is an acquittal, and that's really the most difficult situation to deal with, the statute seems to suggest that if a bond had been posted, a security had been posted, there would be a refund of- What I am, I mean, typically, for example, when there's a seizure of property, typically, not always, but typically when there's a seizure of property, there are no ongoing costs which must be borne. That's correct. And so this is a rather unusual statute, and there's certainly been no finding of guilt in this case. There's been a search warrant. That's true. There's been probable cause. That's true. But what I'm, what, the legal issue is can she obtain relief if the criminal proceeding proceeds and comes to an end? Because typically speaking, you're looking at appellate questions of trying not to segregate out some questions if, no matter what the outcome is, she wouldn't be able to get relief at the end. Are you with me? Yes, I am. Upon an acquittal, there's be no bar that I'm aware of that would prohibit her from seeking some relief for what she claims is her damages. Of course, she would have to prove what her damages are under some civil standard. There would have to be some causal relationship between what she claims is the loss of her business and the loss of the, and the forfeiture of the horses. And I take it the focus of this petition is the seizure of the animals and the requiring of the posting of security for their care. Yes, Your Honor. And how, in an appeal from a criminal conviction, let's assume now not that she's acquitted, but she's convicted. Yes, Your Honor. How would those issues come before the court? Issues related to forfeiture? Issues related to seizure and the posting of security. Well, with respect to seizure in particular, Your Honor, I would suggest that it would come in the typical criminal process. There was a Franks hearing in the criminal case. The Franks motion was denied. And so the issues with respect to the seizure of the animals would probably arise in that context. Or could be raised, at least. Could be raised. And certainly there is a tie-in between the propriety of the seizure, whether it was done properly, and the security statute, because the security statute requires that the animals be lawfully seized. So that we can feel comfortable that whether she's convicted or acquitted, she has available to her all appropriate avenues of relief. 
Am I correct? I would agree with that, Your Honor. Well, that Absolutely. was a question to you. Excuse me? That was a question to you. So the answer to that yes. question is yes. The answer to that question is but yes. But our focus here today is on whether the single justice abused discretion or committed an error of law, isn't it? That's absolutely correct, Your Honor. Yes, it is. And that is the first argument that we've made in our brief. There's no abuse of discretion by the single justice here. There's no clear error of law. And the record ought to be set in cement as of the date at the latest that she filed her full appeal to this Court, which is, I believe, in March of 2005. Thank you, Mr. McGovern. Thank you. Thank you so much.